I laugh again as I think about the ironies of my adventure in the desert. I spend all this time looking for answers and seeking Jesus, and when I finally find him, he says nothing. For that matter, so do I. Then I happen to meet Barabbas, and he reminds me that the silence of Jesus is the very thing that bought our salvation. All this time I've wanted him to speak, but his silence is what screams love and grace and forgiveness the best. Oh, the bittersweet irony of it all. When Job was confronted with the Lord in person, God spoke for himself for a change. Job girded up his loins and put his hand over his mouth. Suddenly, his questions and his troubles, yes, even Job's big troubles, seemed somehow trivial, impertinent in comparison to seeing the big picture. Well, I have not seen or heard from God in the last month, yet all of my questions and my troubles, yes, my little nagging problems, likewise seem trivial and impertinent now that I see the big picture. God has set a certain randomness into this earth. Without it, nothing would work on this fallen planet. If everyone who comes to faith is instantly healed and wealthy, then people would come to faith for the wrong reason. And actually, it would not be faith then, and no one could believe. If every prayer was answered with an immediate yes from God, then each individual human would become God, and God would be a cosmic genie for each of us, who is Lord now. So I have been on the mountain, in the valley of the shadow, in the wilderness, at the oasis of bitterness, a foreign land, the heart of Jerusalem. My location does not matter. Walking by faith is the only thing that matters because my relationship with God is the only thing that will last forever. As a young man, I met this girl named Ellen and thought she was everything I ever wanted in my life. So I bought and read a book called How to Win and Keep a Woman. The book said that four times a year I must buy her flowers. Once a week I must take her out on a date. I should call her at least once a day to touch base, and the book provided a rotating list of what to say to let her know that she was important to me. There was a chapter on techniques for romancing her, formulas for determining if she was happy enough, and what to do about it if she wasn't, and advice on manners and listening techniques. I studied all those things, over 100 ideas in all. And to this day, I strive to follow the advice of the book, How to Win and Keep a Woman. Of course, I don't keep most of those things most days, and I constantly feel guilty because I'm not doing enough. But I try. You may have guessed that there is no such book, How to Win and Keep a Woman. If I do any of those things that I do, it is so much better if those actions arise out of a heart of love rather than a list of do's. There is no romance in following a list of rules, but there is joy in loving a woman to death. I am guided by love, not rules, and the actions arise from the relationship. It was for freedom that Christ set me free. The more I reflect on it, the deeper it goes. It was for freedom that Christ set me free. It wasn't to make me a good boy. It wasn't so that I could save the planet. It wasn't to create a new list of obligations for me to keep. It was for freedom. I am dead, yet I live, yet not I. Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by the power of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Everything else is a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I don't have to love God. I just do. And I don't have to keep the law. But when I love Jesus and when I am led by his Spirit, it affects my behavior. And suddenly I find that What is this? A river runs through this wilderness. It has been flowing around me the whole while, but I hadn't noticed. 
I may be in a desert, living east of Eden and away from the temple. It may be Saturday, or Friday, or Sunday. But it doesn't matter anymore, because the sweet presence of Jesus has found me here. I pray, and I feel like I'm being heard. I begin to hear his voice again, my shepherd's voice. I know his voice, for I am his and he is mine. He begins to bless my nighttime and daytime dreams again. Unique coincidences occur through which the Lord makes his will and his guidance known. I begin to feel again those strong impulses of compassion and gratitude that had such a place in my life before. I am beginning to know that I am walking in the Spirit again. For some weeks now, I have felt alone, perhaps abandoned. But I have a promise that I am wrong in how I feel. I will never leave you or forsake you. One who is more faithful than I made that promise. Maybe I have been looking for love in all the wrong places. His Spirit indwells whether or not I feel Him. His grace is always with me, even when I am feeling neglected by the world. His loving kindness is everlasting. His love endures forever. That is the most popular praise chorus or refrain in the Old Testament. It is the watchword that Israel sang more than any other. His love endures forever. It's not about the location or even the destination. It's about who I am with, where I am. I may be in the desert. I may be in a garden. Maybe the garden is in a desert. None of it matters anymore. Jesus is all and in all and over all and through all. And he is more than enough. Wait, what was that? Did I just feel a drop?